If you uh, have your Bibles tonight, I hope you do, turn to Galatians chapter 4. And uh, we are going to read a few verses there from 8 to 20, and then we're going to talk on this subject, heart to heart. How many of you have ever had a heart to heart with anybody? Anybody ever done that? Well, Paul's getting ready to have a heart to heart with these at, uh, here in Galatians, and he is going to have a heart to heart with us tonight. Well, let's all stand and we'll read together out of Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 20. And the Bible says there, How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods? But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, and ye have not injured me at all. You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not, nor rejected, but receive me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you had have plucked out, of your own, out your own eyes and given them to me. I am therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. The jealousy affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be jealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I'm present with you. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Now, I know that you may not understand all of that, but here in a moment we're going to explain what Paul is trying to say and what he is saying to us and how that he corrects them and how that he gives them uh, not only correction, but he loves them and tells them how to get their lives right with God. How many of you know there is nothing wrong when you come to church with the Holy Spirit convicting you and getting you right with him? And that I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit, aren't you? I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you tonight, and we thank you for your precious, precious word. And Father, tonight we just ask that you will touch us once again with the teaching and the preaching of your word. I pray, Father, that you'll move me out of the way because I'm nothing. And I pray that you'll fill me with your spirit and preach and teach through me tonight the very things that you would have us to hear. Help us to leave this place knowing surely it's been good to be in the house of God. Thank you for what you're going to do. In your precious name we pray these things. Amen. Tell somebody you love them before you sit down there. If uh, you have not seen Jonathan yet and you, um, as far as telling him that you sing and do specials, you need to do that. He is trying to get all of his um, uh, schedules together so that all of you can have a schedule. What we may do, and he made a good suggestion on that tonight, is that we might put it in the bulletin maybe a month ahead of the special singing or something like that so that everybody knows when they're singing and all that. And so he'll get those schedules out to you. I, I hate singing him to death, but I love to hear him sing, don't you? Yeah. And so uh, we thank uh, God that uh, he uh, can sing. About any time I ask him, he just jumps up here and sings for us. So uh, you should be getting that schedule and uh, be able to uh, uh, sing here real soon. Well, you know, in this, in this study... I have learned a lot about, a, you know, being closer to Christ in my relationship. Not, not closer to Christ, and we don't, we don't earn that closeness by things we do. Do you understand that? It's not by things that we do. It's, it's who we know and that relationship with him that we build upon. 
And that's kind of what Paul is saying again tonight. He's going into that same concept of letting us know what a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is. You know, over the last few messages, it's, uh, Paul has taken the tone, especially in the messages that we have preached here lately, he's taken the tone of an Old Testament scholar or theologian. He's going back to, uh, you know, uh, what Jesus did, but he's going and he's showing us why Jesus and the law, you know, they were saying that you had to have the law, some of the law plus Jesus before you could be saved, but he's going back to that, and he was doing that over these last few messages. But now, tonight, he comes to the theme kind of like a loving parent. He's going to have a sit-down talk with you one-on-one. And how many of you know that's the way Jesus does us? He, he just has a sit-down talk with us as a loving parent. He's going to have a heart-to-heart talk with these Galatians here and tell them why they are wrong in what they are doing. Um, I imagine sometimes, you know, and, and churches don't really say this, you know, and I'm talking about some of the liberal stuff that are going on, you know, in our t- day and time, but I sat down today and I was thinking to myself, oh, what if you went to a church and, um, and you wouldn't go to a church like this? I'm just saying, what if you did go to the ch- a church, maybe visit it, and you hear things like, well, we don't worry about your mismanaged anger. Uh, nobody here is going to confront you because we don't uh, like conflict. Or what if they said something like this? Well, we don't worry, you know, uh, that you have hordes and lots of money because we're never going to preach on tithing here or giving back to God because we don't want to make you mad. What if you went to a church like that? What if you went to a church that said, well, uh, we might occasionally talk about sin, but if we reference sin, we're going to reference to out there. You know, we're not ever going to talk about your sin. Because if we talk about your sin, it might hurt your little feelings. So we're not going to talk about your sin. Now, what if you went to a church like that? Do you know there are churches like that? They may not preach it from the pulpit, but they practice it. They don't preach on sin. They don't preach on tithing. They don't preach on giving. They don't preach on any of this. They preach on a feel-good gospel. Well, I want to tell you, that goes against the Word of God. Because right here tonight, He's not going to make you feel good before you leave here. Now, you may blame it on the preacher. You may say, that preacher made me feel bad. No, it's not the preacher, it's the Bible. And and that's the way the Bible is. How many of you know sometimes you'll go to church and you'll feel like shouting down glory? And sometimes you'll go to church and you'll feel about, yeah, it's big. And it ain't the preacher. It's the Word. It's the Holy Spirit working inside of you, trying to bring you to a growth area in your life. So Paul is going to do that here with these Galatians. He's going to not preach a feel-good message tonight. And by the way, sometimes the truth hurts. And sometimes we need to come out of the church and heal from the truth. I've had to do that, have you? I mean, sit down and heal because it's cut so bad. God has just cut me so bad, sometimes I have to go home and heal. And the way I heal is through prayer and supplication, and the way I heal is through the Word of God. By getting my life right and doing what God wants me to be. One preacher put it this way, he said, We've become so sissified and passive in this day and age that we don't preach the gospel anymore. Now don't look at me like that. I didn't say it, that preacher said that. I'd give you his name, but I didn't write it down. You see, when you come to church, somebody, the pastor needs to get in the pulpit and preach the truth. We need to know the truth, folks, because we're in a world tonight of just lies and falseness and tickling the ears. That's what we're in tonight. 
And I want, I want the gospel to, I want someone to preach the gospel to, to teach me the truth, don't you? And tell me the truth. And so that's what Paul's going to do tonight. He's going to go in there now and he's throwing everything out and he's just going to tell them the truth about everything. Whether it hurts their feelings or not. And somebody needs to do that. So, to tell the truth, why is he doing that? Well, first of all, because God corrects us through his word. Now, I want you to look again in verses 8 through 11, just a second. I, I think we need to read this again. It says, How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after, that means you didn't serve anybody. And some of you served other gods, idols. But now after that you have known God, after you have heard the truth and you've known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements where until you desire again to be in bondage? He said, Paul is really saying, I just don't understand you. I don't understand how you've known the truth and you've known God and you want to go back into slavery. Back into your old ways. How in the world could this happen to you? How could you do this? That's what he's saying. Then he says, he says in verse 10, you observe days and months and times and years, but I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of you. Now, <laughs> how many of you, if a preacher got in the pulpit and said to you, I'm afraid of you? That's what he said to him. I'm afraid of you, lest you have bestowed upon you, uh, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain, empty of substance. He says. You see, what Paul is doing here in this chapter, in this last part of this chapter, he is coming to them, to these Galatian believers, and he's going to tell them again, once again, about their glorious inheritance in Christ. He says in verse 7 of that same chapter, I'll just read it here in verse 7, he says this, Wherefore art thou no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You're a son, he says. You've become sons and daughters of God. What is wrong with you? I'm just going to tell you about your glorious inheritance once again. But he says his great concern, Paul's great concern about all of this, is that they had not been living as sons and daughters. And I'm here to tell you tonight, whether you believe it or not, our country has not been living like we're a Christian nation. Sons and daughters. He says, I have great concern about you not living like you're supposed to, like sons and daughters, but you've reverted back to wanting to be slaves again. Who in the world would want to do that? So he rebukes them sharply here. He corrects their confused thinking in verse 9. He says, you've known God, or rather you've been known of God, and you turn again to the weak and the beggarly, that means that's the elements that, the, the, the being a slave, you've gone back into bondage. You see, the whole point of Galatians, and I believe this with all my heart because I've studied the whole thing, the whole point of Galatians is warning people to avoid legalism. The false teachers that were, and by the way, in the end times, how many of you know that those false teachings will increase? You see, I believe we're on the right thing here that we're teaching on Wednesday night. I believe we're in the right area because we're in that time. See, the whole point of it is to warn them of this, false teachers. And what these false teachers were doing, they were encouraging uh, these uh, uh, Gentile Christians to ignore God's law. Uh, they were encouraging them, not in the way you're thinking about that right now, uh, they were taking them back to their pagan days. See, they wanted them to observe the Mosaic law. And they said, you have to observe this, plus, you know, know Jesus, and if you do both together, then you'll be justified. But we all know tonight that's not what God did when he uh, sent his son to die on the cross. 
It's Jesus. He's the one that forgives us of our sin. He's the only way that we please God. Nothing that we do. There's no thing that we can do. Uh, no matter how much money we give or, or how many good things we do in life, morally, uh, there's nothing we can do to get to God except through Jesus. He's the only way. You see, Paul is saying that these Judaizers, these legalistics, had come in and they said that really you can earn your own way. You can earn your own salvation. And this old world tonight thinks the same thing. One preacher put it this way, he said, through scrupulous Bible morality and religion, it's just, it's just one way that they can get to heaven. That's what he that they, the Judaizers and the legalists was teaching. That that's the way they could get to heaven. That they could get to heaven on their moral practices. Don't matter how moral you are. Without Jesus, you can't go. You see, in the end, the religious person, and I'm talking about someone that's just religious. You know those people, don't you? Oh, they're just religious, you know. Uh, religious about everything. You know, I, I just live a good life. I'm just religious. Listen, folks, I'm not religious. I know Jesus. Religion will never get you to heaven. It won't. And that's what Paul was saying to them. It doesn't matter what kind of sacraments you do. It doesn't matter how good you are and moral you are. There's only one way to heaven. You see, the religious person is as lost as, and enslaved as the unsaved person if they don't know Jesus. So these people, they're trying to be their own Savior and Lord is what they were trying to do. They were doing it in different ways, but that's really the end result. They were trying to get their own way to heaven. So Paul comes in and he argues this. He says, if you were a slave and you're now a son, how in the world can you turn back again to slavery? How in the world can you do that? Why would you want to do that? That's where we get that old saying of, what is there to go back to? Let me understand tonight, there is nothing for you to go back to. It's the same thing Paul was saying. Why in the world, you've become sons and daughters of God, why in the world would you want to go back into slavery? How can you allow yourself to be enslaved by the very spirits from whom Jesus Christ has rescued you from? Your religion is degenerated into an external formalism, and that's exactly what it was. That's exactly what they were trying to do. They were trying to say, we're saved because of what you see on the outside of us. And there's a lot of people that do that tonight. What you see on the outside of us, then you know, you know. No, folks, it's what's on the inside of you. And by the way, only God knows that. He's the only one that knows that about you. You see, it has become a dreary routine of rules and regulations through these Judaizers, through these legalists that they brought back to the Galatians, and they were trying to entrap them and enslave them in this again. And Paul fears that all the time and trouble he has spent with them and preaching to them was wasted. He said that in there. He said, what in the world? I've spent all this time with you and I've taught you the word of God and give you the word of God and here you are and you want to go back to being a slave. Instead of growing in the liberty with which Christ has set them free, they have slipped back into that old bondage again. Isn't that foolish, folks? Isn't that foolish? But you see it in churches all the time. People get mad at this and are mad at that one or hurt at this or hurt at that or they didn't sing their song or whatever it was and they say, I'm just going to stay home. What in the world? I mean, really? What in the world? 
if the Lord Jesus has saved you and bought you and give you this freedom in Him, you're not worshiping me and you're not worshiping the church. You're worshiping Him. And that's exactly what Paul was saying here. What in the world is wrong with you all? You've tasted the, the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and what in the world is wrong with you? So he fears that all the time and trouble he's put with them has been wasted time. You see, it's kind of like fo the foolishness of of when the prodigal son, you remember what he said, the prodigal son. It's kind of like what I'm talking about tonight. The prodigal son, now he came to his senses, and, and that was good. That's a good thing. But he said this, he said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And that's kind of the way that these Galatians had got, you know, because of their worthiness, you know. I'm not I'm not I'm no longer listen to this I'm no longer worthy to be called your son treat me as one of your what servants treat me as one of your servants how in the world can anyone be so foolish as to say you have made me your son but I'd rather just be your slave listen folks we are sons and daughters of God We've inherited all that he has. Amen? Are you with me tonight? You have what he has. You say, well, I will when I get into heaven. I'm saying right now, as sons and daughters, you have what he has in you. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Amen? It's ours. Because we're his sons and daughters. So why in the world would we want to go back to the slave house? I'm not going, are you? No, I'm not. I, I, I'm going to live for him because I love him. And that's what Paul is saying to them. He's saying, why in the world would you want to go back uh, to being a slave? See, Paul's basis for making this argument, how can you turn your back on the freedom that you found in Christ, is that, folks, listen to me. Our knowing of God will rise and fall depending on many things, but God's knowing of us is absolutely fixed and solid. How many believe that? <laughs> it's, he, he loves us. He didn't move. We moved. Amen. And Paul was saying the same thing to them. God's not the one that's moved. You're the one that's moved because his love for you and his dependence in you and upon you is fixed and solid. The great and central basis of Christianity and assurance is just not how much our, our hearts are set on God, but how unshakable his heart is set on us. His heart is set on you tonight. Did you know that? You know how much His heart is set on you? He sent His only begotten Son to die for you. To die for you. You know people say things like that all the time. If you'd have been the only one, He'd have sent His Son. Well, folks, in essence, He died for you. He died for me. You need to put your name there. Jesus died for Curtis Hurt. And put your name there. He died for us. God thought enough of you that he wanted you to have a way out. And these people were just throwing that and kicking it in the mud. Because they wanted to go back to the law. The law plus Jesus equals salvation. He's saying these legalists, they want to bring you into a legalistic uh, uh, time in your life to where you can't really be free. And free indeed, and they're liars is what he's saying. And you need to think about what Jesus is to you. I think sometimes that's the reason we get ourselves in trouble. We don't think about what Jesus is to us. 
Oh, we think about it when it comes to our lost loved ones, our lost neighbor, our lost friend that sits beside us at work. But what does this mean, this salvation mean to you tonight? What did he do for you? You have to go back to you and where you were when Jesus reached way down to get you. I know where I was. And I'm telling you, folks, I'm so thankful that he reached way down. His heart is for us. You see, Paul said in verse 11, I'm afraid, in essence, he said, I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Now, at first glance, those remarks from Paul, they seem really harsh, don't they? They, they seem really kind of self-centered, but they're appropriate, and I want to tell you why. It's kind of like, you know, a father, you know. Uh, I used to, uh, when my little girls were uh, small, you know, I'd get them out on them bikes trying to teach them to ride a bike, you know. And you're, you're, as, fra- you're as afraid as they are because you're afraid they're going to fall, and then mama's going to come out the door and, you know, and if mama comes out the door, it's all over. But anyway, I used to teach them little girls how to ride bikes, you know. And I'd first start out on something soft, you know, like the grass. And, I, you know, I'd, and then they'd want to go, you know, on the concrete. So you'd get them out there and ride. But I thought of this when I was thinking of this uh, Christian assurance, you know, and how God's heart's unshakable towards us and... He says here, I'm afraid that I may have labored over you in vain. He was doubting, you know, kind of what they they were grasping about the gospel message. And he said, uh, it's like a father, though. That tells his son (laughs) who's just fallen on his back. I mean, we would not never say this. And that little son, you know, scratches his arm or something. He says, well, son... It looks like I've just wasted my time teaching you how to ride that bike. Now, that's harsh, isn't it? I mean, if my daddy ever said that to me, that broke my heart, you know. Son, I shouldn't have never taught you. You ain't never going to learn, you know. But that's kind of what Paul was saying. And you know why he said that? Because it was so... He had to shock them back into reality, folks. And I'm here to tell you tonight, some of you need to be shocked back into reality of knowing what you've got in God. Sometimes we belittle what God has done in our life. We never should do that because what he's done in your life is nothing less than a miracle. And where he's brought you from is nothing less than a miracle what God has done in you. As the apostles to the Gentiles, Paul's life and ministry was tied to converts. Now, I want to say this because it's truth. I mean, he was the minister to these he was the he, he had converts. He had people that got saved. And by the way, folks, there's nothing more thrilling than uh, somebody getting saved. Amen? And that's the way Paul was. There was nothing more thrilling than getting them saved. But not only that, teaching them and growing them in the Word of God. He had spent his life. Are you understanding what he's saying to them? He had spent his life teaching them and grounding them in the gospel. And then these legalists come in and tore it all apart. He's saying to them, I'm broken hearted. Because my life is joyed by converts. My my life is joyed by people getting saved. And that ought to be the way of the church. And that ought to be the way of the pastor. If we ever get used to not seeing people saved, then we need to close the doors and go home. And that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying, uh, I'm so glad. I I love my converts. My success and my converts, seeing them save, seeing them grow. But now they have turned their back on the things that I've taught them. They're falling short of faithfulness. 
You say, I don't believe Paul was that way. Well, listen to him in Thessal Thessalonians. He says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even the uh, presence of the Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our, what? Read that with me. Our glory and joy. These converts. Can you see now how he was killed? How his heart was broken? Because these legalists had come in there and taught them things that were wrong and not right. That, it, that, that they had taken them away from, from the things that God had done in their lives. And they're uh, reverting back to go, wanting to go into slavery again. You know, spiritual slavery. And he said, you're breaking my heart. Because you are our glory and our joy. This is what I get joy in in my life about seeing you prosper seeing you do good I'm going to give you one more thing tonight secondly God's love moves us that's from verses 12 through 20 brethren I beseech you be as I am for I am as ye are you have not injured me at all listen to him now he, he's starting to, to treat him uh, like a parent You've not injured me at all. You know how uh, through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you. He said, I came sometimes when I was not able. Anybody ever felt that way? He said, I came sometimes through the infirmity, through the heartache, through all of the fighting and all the people trying to stone me and kill me. He said, I came through infirmity sometimes just to preach to you and talk to you. In my temptation, which was in my flesh, you despise not. He said, I'm not a healthy man. And, 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 and in some uh, areas in history, they said that, uh, blessed Paul, he, he was all humpback and all that. He was not nothing to look at. He was not nothing to, to really be desired to hear from. He said, but that didn't bother you. You still took me in. You still love me. You still listened to me. He says, here he says, where is then the blessedness, in verse 15, you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have get, you loved me so much, you would have been harmed yourself before me. But then he goes on to say, in verse 16, am I therefore become your enemy? What is this now? Since this stuff has come in and you've allowed these people to come in and teach you all kinds of different stuff and falseness, what is it now? Am I your enemy? Do you not love me anymore because I tell you the truth? Then he goes on to say in verse 17, They jealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them, but it is a... Uh, it is good to be jealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you, my little children of whom I travail in birth again. This is like a parent. Are you hearing this? Like a parent, like a mama. I mean, it's like, it's like that motherly love like, like we speak of. He says, he says, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. He said, I want to change the way that I'm preaching to you. I want to love you and teach you. I want to, but you're not ready. You're not there. I want you to be, but you're not. You know what's true of the human family is also true in the spiritual family as well. Because now, up to this point, Paul's letter has chastised the Galatians. He has, he has uh, talked to them about their waywardness. He has talked to them about their foolishness. Matter of fact, you remember over in chapter 3, I think he said, he said they were foolish and they had been bewitched. Do you remember me talking about that? He scolded them. He's done everything a parent needs to do, and now he's going to love on them a little bit. He's going to wrap his arms around them. He's going to try to tell them the truth of how much he loves them. Matter of fact, he says there in Galatians 4.12, he says, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am. 
For I am as ye are. He said, we're brothers and sisters. We're family. How many of you know tonight that's what we are? That's the reason we shouldn't have ought against our brothers and sisters. I know, you know, i got two sisters, and I know sometimes, you know, we get a little out of whack with each other. Don't look at me like that. All of you do that. But you know what? It don't last long. And I'm going to tell you why. Because they're my sisters. Even with your wife and husband sometimes, you get out... I mean, you're not going to be in, you know, you're going to get out of whack every now and then. Amen? But it don't last long, does it? You don't know why? Because you love each other. Well, the same thing's true in church, folks. The same thing's true with your brothers and sisters. One of these days, we'll live in eternity together forevermore. We're going to be together forevermore. How long is that, preacher? That's a long time. Amen? And we're going to live together and love one another. Paul says here, he says, you're family. You're, I'm like you, you're like me. Now, a legalist mindset couldn't say something like this. Because you know what legalism says? It says this. Now listen to me. Legalism says if you're not exactly like me, if you don't dress the way I do and talk the way I do and sing the way I do, then you're not saved. You're not ready to go to heaven because it's my standards that you have to go by instead of God's standards. But grace frees us from the bondage of legalism. Hmm. Paul says, I become all things to all people. So that I might win one for Christ or some for Christ. That's what he says. He says, I'm going to love them right where they're at. Isn't that amazing how smart and how God's spirit through him came out so that even tonight in 2019 we can preach these things and they're relevant? He, he says... I become all things for all men to win some, that I might win them for Christ. See, what he wants to do in his ministry, it's amazing if you get this. What he wants to do in his ministry through the Holy Spirit as God leads him, he wants to step into their lives, to their families. Paul's wanting to be their pastor. He's wanting to come in and teach them the word of God and, and love on them when they're hurting and, you know, do the things that a pastor does. That's what he wants. But through this legalism that they've accepted and all this stuff they've heard, these false teachers, they become strangers. And it's killing him. Because they've become strangers. I've felt that in my own ministry sometimes. You know, there's sometimes that that people leave and they don't tell you anything. They just go. And you know something, after pouring your life into people and pouring your ministry into people and, and praying and agonizing and asking God what He wants you to teach and what He wants you to preach, when one of your little ones leave, and that's what Paul is talking about here, when one of them go out, or even maybe even go astray, it kills you. And by the way, folks, if it doesn't kill the if it doesn't hurt the pastor, then he's not much of a pastor. And Paul was saying, you broke my heart. It's hurting me inside to see this. What these Judaizers have done to you, what these legalists have taught you, he said, all they're doing, Paul is talking to them, he said, all they're doing is flattering you and making much of you. And all they want from you is you to flatter them and make much of them. That's all they want. And folks, people that are not really true and not really know the Lord Jesus Christ, that's mostly what they want. They want you to flatter them, put them up on a pedestal. 
How many of you know the only one that goes on the pedestal is God? Paul is trying to tell them. Did you notice here in these verses I read, he calls them little children. And that term there is really important that you understand this. It's kind of like he takes on the, he takes on the, the mindset of, the, of being the mother. Little children. Because how many of you know that a woman, and I, you may not have heard this in a long time, is the nurturer in the family? Does anybody understand that? And God meant for you to be that way. Don't look at me like that. God meant for you as a woman to be the nurturer of the children and the husband and the family unit. And so Paul is taking on the nurturer aspect, my little children, the, the, the motherly aspect to these. He's, he's talking to them a, as a mother. And you say, well, is this just to tie them to his apron string? No, no. It has nothing to do with that. The metaphor here of him taking on the aspect of a mother is, to, is not to illustrate their dependence on him, but to let them know that he travails over them. In other words, in his prayer life, he's travailing over what they've done like a mother would a child that's gone astray. When I think of that there, I think of my mom when I come home from those Friday and Saturday nights, her being at the bottom of her bed and praying, and I could hear her praying, and I would cold my ears where I wouldn't have to hear her praying for me. And that's what Paul was doing for these people at Galatia. He was travailing over them because they had gone astray. My little children whom I travail says in verse 19, notice the phrase, until Christ is formed in you. That's important, until Christ is formed in you. What does that mean? Well, he knows that Christ dwells in them. But there's a difference in the dwelling and the forming. Because how many of you know, God is forming us into his image every day of our lives. One of these days, folks, whether you believe it or not, when we get to heaven, we'll be just like him. And it's part of the forming process. And that's what Paul says. He says, I want to help you form. I want to help you form into Christ, into the image of Christ. I want to show you how to grow. I want to show you how to welcome the Lord. And accept all of His will in your life. I want to show you. And I travail. I pray and my heart aches. Paul says because you're not allowing me to do that. You see, in any kind of pastors and, and congregations... You see, in any of that, you've got to understand the pastor is not worth his salt if he's not praying and travailing and, and seeking God's will in the church and in the lives of the people. I'm telling you that from a heart that knows that. And Brother Dave can say the same thing, that we... we as pastors, if God has really called us to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's some travailing in that. There's some praying. There's some seeking God's will for the people of the church. But not only that, if that's true, then as members and as saved individuals, you ought to desire the sincere word of God. You ought to desire for God to Fill you up when you come to church. You ought to desire for God to give you overflowing when you come to church. And if the two work together, I'm telling you folks, God will build a tremendous relationship. And that's what Paul was desiring. Everybody with me say amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for tonight's message and our teaching in the book of Galatians. Thank you for everything you've given us tonight. 
Father, help us to seek your will in our lives. Help you to seek us to seek what we need to do as men and women that love you in the church, in your place of worship, in our own lives. We love you tonight. You may be here tonight and God is dealing with you on something or you need to come and pray for someone. God has put that on your heart. We'll give just a few moments tonight.